channel to update the latest information. We are QTN. Today, there is significant news coming from the Rehive direction, following the Ukrainian forces successfully pushing back the Russians from their final line of fortification in front of Robodin. The Ukrainians have now shifted their focus to the flanks. Their primary OB objective at present is to enhance their tactical position around Robotin before making an attempt to capture it. As we can observe, the Ukrainians have gradually advanced nearly 5 kilometers along a 16 kilometer wide front line. However, in terms of global perspective, this advancement of 5 kilometers does not grant them a strategic advantage. The Ukrainians are still 20 kilometers away from Tokmag and 70 kilometers away from Melitopo. It has been a month since the active stage of the counteroffensive operation commenced, and the current outcome is not what most people anticipated, particularly following the immensely successful hierarchy counteroffensive. But does this imply that the counteroffensive operation is failing? No, not at all. Firstly, the counteroffensive operation is still in its early stages since the Ukrainians have not yet deployed their strategic reserves. Secondly, the Ukrainian command had forewarned everyone that this counteroffensive would differ significantly from the one in Hierarchive and would require considerably more time. The hurricane counteroffensive was swift and triumphant because it occurred before mobilization, catching the Russians off guard. The Ukrainians unexpectedly identified a weak spot, penetrated a defense line, and caused the collapse of the entire front. This time, the circumstances are entirely different. The Russians have a larger force, prepared multiple lines of defense, and expected the counteroffensive to occur in the south. This explains why the first line of defense is overcrowded with troops and equipment. A Ukrainian soldier recently reported that there are approximately 60 pieces of heavy equipment around Robotin that they need to destroy in order to advance. This is why the Ukrainians have adopted a completely different approach. Recently, a prominent Russian source published a brief interview with a Russian soldier who precisely described the Ukrainian tactics. According to him, the main focus for the Ukrainians right now is to continue improving their tactical position and maintain a steady pace of advancement. The goal of the Ukrainians is not simply to penetrate the Russian defense, but rather to deplete their accumulated ammunition, equipment, and reserves. According to a Russian soldier's report, the Ukrainians are employing a cautious approach, testing the capabilities of each Russian strongpoint in defensive operations. Their strategy involves initiating light engagements to gradually force the Russians to expend their ammunition. As the intensity of the engagements increases, the Russians are compelled to unload their artillery. Unlike Ukrainian systems, the Russian multiple launch rocket systems require the entire system to return to the depot for reloading which consumes a significant amount of time. Once the Russian strongpoints have depleted their ammunition and artillery support, the Ukrainians intensify their actions and deploy two or three additional assault units in parallel. They also utilize various types of artillery systems. Ukrainian reconnaissance drone operators work closely with artillery crews, including those operating heavy mortars, to identify and target up to four enemy strongpoints simultaneously. With the lack of artillery support, the Russian strongpoints become more vulnerable, enabling Ukrainian infantry squads to approach and establish control over the trenches. Overall, the most effective strategy to undermine well-prepared Russian fortifications is to create a temporary shortage of ammunition and artillery support. By forcing the Russians to unload all of their equipment, the Ukrainians weaken their defenses. The initial assault is crucial, as it exploits the moment when all weapons are likely to be loaded. Once the concentration of fire diminishes, the Ukrainian forces have a chance to advance. However, the first line of defense is the most challenging, as the Russians are well prepared and adequately supplied. Nevertheless, by depleting the Russian stockpiles, the Ukrainian forces can gradually deteriorate their defensive capabilities and eventually consider penetrating deeper into the front line, countering the invasion of Ukraine. Now, let's delve into the hottest part of the front and the remarkable victories achieved by the Ukrainian army. We have compiled the latest updates for you. Join Adrian as we go to the front lines. The Ukrainian armed forces are executing massive offensive operations in the regions of Zaporizhia, Dnipro, Kurs, Antoinette, News Donald, Skrichin, and Neil Luhans with unwavering momentum. Intense clashes are simultaneously taking place across these critical front lines. 
The Ukrainians have successfully liberated the last river pool in Zaporizhia and a total of nine settlements in the region from Russian control. Continuing their offensive, the Kiev forces have advanced towards Nipokursen. Ukrainian troops have successfully sunk Russian boats in the area and gained control over the Antonovka bridge in the Kursk direction. Despite Russia being cornered in Zaporizhia due to these relentless offensives, the Ukrainian attacks persist. While analysts and military experts discuss which front line will be the next target for the Ukrainian armed forces, Kiev's offensive plan has refocused on the Zaporizhia region once again. This time, the Ukrainians have chosen Bodinsk, an important port city. Numerous explosions have been reported within the city, leaving local residents astonished by the scale of the eruptions. Let's examine the key moments of this critical offensive operation together. Recently, 11 powerful explosions rocked Bodinsk, resulting in massive black clouds engulfing the city's airspace. The targets of these attacks were military facilities under Russian army control. The Southern Command of Ukraine declared, a successful attack by the defense forces on the morning of June 30, 2023, destroyed the occupiers' headquarters and the fuel and lubricant depot on the outskirts of the temporarily occupied Bodinsk. This military base served as the command center and operational area for the Russian army in the city. The city of Bodinsk suffered severe damage as a result of the attacks, which has been confirmed by Russian sources. Russian authorities announced that the Ukrainian armed forces utilized UK-made storm shadow missiles to target military facilities. The range of these missiles allows them to strike rear facilities of the Russian armed forces, including those in Bodinsk. It is logical for the Ukrainians to employ storm shadows in this attack, as these missiles can surpass long-range defenses and are part of the Ukrainian army's inventory. The resistance movement in the area also provided critical assessments of the attack on the Russian headquarters in Bodinsk. Agents of the resistance movement were the first to report the effectiveness of the attack, and they subsequently shared a message stating that the situation for the Russians was very dire. Russia fears that these attacks indicate that the Ukrainians no longer recognize borders and that they will eventually extend their attacks to Crimea as part of Kiev's offensive plans. Considering the recent offensive operations by the Ukrainian armed forces, it is evident that the Russians' concerns are valid. The port city of Bodinsk holds strategic importance for Kiev, as it serves as a critical point to create a land attack corridor leading towards Crimea. It is observable that the Ukrainians are attempting to reach Crimea by targeting coastal cities. Therefore, it is expected that the southern front lines, such as Dnipro, Zaprasia, Melitopol, Tokmak, and Kirsten, are part of Kiev's offensive plans. The actions of Ukrainian partisans in Melitopol and Antokma continue from where they left off. Partisan groups supporting Kiev have gained strength from the successes of the Ukrainian armed forces in critical areas like Zaporizhia and Dnipro, and they are intensifying their resistance actions in the Kirsten region. The city of Kirsten has become a hellish environment for Russian troops, as Ukrainian forces have captured most of the supply routes from Dnipro and Zaprasia. Additionally, with the destruction of some dams in Nova Kakovka, the situation has become even more challenging for the remaining Russian forces. Furthermore, the Russian trenches in the affected areas, such as Kirsten, are now submerged underwater, as the Ukrainians have gained complete control. Kiev's extensive offensive plans have prevented small Russian strike groups from regrouping and returning to Russia. In response, Moscow retaliated by targeting Ukrainian cities with missile and drone strikes. These attacks resulted in a devastating toll, with 12 people killed on Tuesday, including three teenagers, making it one of the deadliest attacks in recent months. Additionally, at least 60 individuals were injured when a pizza restaurant in the city of Chromatis, located in the eastern Donets region under Ukrainian control but close to Russian-occupied parts of the country, was targeted. These attacks on innocent civilians have drawn strong condemnation from international sources. The Ria Pizza restaurant was a popular gathering place for international journalists, volunteers, and Ukrainian soldiers seeking respite from the nearby front lines. Ukrainian President Zelensky announced the arrest of a Russian agent allegedly involved in the attack, who will be charged with treason. Throughout June, several deadly missile and drone strikes have occurred across the country, including in Kiev, Zaporizhia, and the southern port of Odessa. Even Zelensky's hometown of Kravieri was hit in a strike on a residential area. 
Despite these Russian attacks targeting civilians, the Ukrainians have remained resolute, and Kiev's offensive operations have continued to advance steadily. The Ukrainian counteroffensive persists in the eastern Donets and southeastern Zaporozhye regions, with the Ukrainian authorities claiming to have seized the strategic initiative near the city of Bakhmut. Additionally, the aftermath of the revolt of Russia's Wagner mercenaries and its potential consequences for President Vladimir Putin continue to be analyzed. Following this insurgency, Ukraine has pressed on with its counteroffensive operations. The Kyiv administration reports that its forces have advanced approximately 2 kilometers along the KLYCH southwest of Bagmud and have made gains. Ukrainian forces have also continued offensive operations in various areas along the front line, with significant clashes reported, according to the US-based Institute for War Studies. In response to these statements, President Zelensky expressed that it was a positive day for Ukraine. However, he did not provide specific details about the gains or mention any particular area. It is also reported that Ukrainian forces have made progress in the southern Curtin region, crossing the Dnieper River and establishing a foothold on its left bank. Pro-Russian war bloggers have acknowledged these recent advances. Notably, these gains followed a 24-hour mutiny by the Wagner mercenary group, which occurred 200 kilometers south of Moscow. The rebellion came to an end after Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko mediated between Afghan precaution and Putin. Ukrainian officials claimed that the countdown for Putin had begun after the Wagner rebellion. The focus in the Ukrainian capital shifted directly to the revolt of the Wagner group, Afghan precaution, and its consequences for Putin and the course of the war in Ukraine. The events on the Russian border reinforced the belief in Kyiv that Putin's tenure as Russian president is coming to an end. President Zelensky's closest adviser, Andriy Yermak, stated during a briefing in Kyiv that Putin's time in power is limited. Yermak mentioned the year Russia invaded Ukraine for the first time, annexing Crimea, and explained that Ukraine's position has become apparent to the entire world since 2014. According to Ukrainian officials and senior figures, including Yermak, it is argued that President Putin would be unable to recover from a disastrous loss of authority. The Wagner Rebellion and Mr. Pragasen's accusations against the Kremlin's motives for war have further diminished Putin's chances of retaining power. It is crucial to bear in mind that Ukrainian assessments of the Wagner Rebellion and their views on their Russian adversaries are shaped by the ongoing war, which they rightly perceive as a struggle for national survival. The Ukrainians have adeptly waged a media war and have consistently conveyed their messages to their own people, Western allies, and their enemies in Moscow. Hence, Kiev's evaluations of the Wagner Rebellion hold significant weight. While the Wagner Revolt may have concluded, the situation in Russia reflects a significant challenge to Vladimir Putin's authority, the most serious he has faced since assuming the presidency in 2000. Senior officials in Kyiv believe that unofficial but organized networks of disillusioned insiders in Russia are opposing Putin's leadership. Alexei Danilov, Secretary of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, indicates that these networks include security forces officials and representatives of Russian oligarchs who consider Putin's decision to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of the previous year as a personal disaster and a threat to Russia itself. After the recent uprising in Russia, Danilov and others were convinced that Putin's time in power was coming to an end. When asked about the evidence to support his analysis, Danilov pointed directly to the events unfolding on the Russian border and in Belarus. Mikhail Podoliak, another close advisor to President Zelensky, agrees that there are multiple factions within Russia seeking to seize power. He argues that Putin's top-down authoritarian system has created a void at the center of power. Furthermore, an anonymous senior official suggests that President Putin may have to remove Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu and Chief of Staff General Valery Gerasimov, perhaps in response to another military setback. In the short term, the Wagner Rebellion had a notable negative consequence for Russia as it contributed to the successful progress of the Ukrainian army's offensive operations. However, Russian sources, Moscow officials, and Kremlin supporting groups are currently focusing on highlighting the mistakes of the Russian administration rather than acknowledging the Ukrainian army's progress. This situation has resulted in a vacuum of leadership, and resolving this vacuum may be a fundamental solution for Russia.